the United States has a history of imposing and coercing governments to carry out anti-drug operations. So people can mix that. But actually, Felipe Calderon said in that case, it was Mexico bringing this to the table. Now, he said to me, he described the meeting, Felipe Calderon. He said he sat down with George W. Bush and he said, look, you know, I think America needs to uh, support Mexico because Americans take all these drugs and look at the damage it's doing in Mexico. And Bush said, OK, yeah, what do you need? And Calderon said, have you seen the show 24? And Bush said, yeah. He says, I want all the gadgets in that show. Okay, so Yon, I basically slipped into your DMs a few weeks ago uh, because you're one of the foremost journalists and experts, I'd say, about the world of narcos and the cartels in Mexico and how that interacts with the, the United States. And I've been hearing all this rhetoric coming out of Congress about how maybe we need to invade Mexico to deal with the drug crisis. So I thought, who better to talk to than you? Now, for a little bit of background, the CDC found that in 2022, there were 109,680 deaths from drugs. That is a very high number. According to the NIH, non-prescription opioid deaths, primarily from meth, stood at 5,716 in 2015 compared to 32,537 in 2021. So we do see a, a surge in those kinds of deaths. This, along with violence, uh, on the U.S. and Mexican sides of the border has attracted the attention of U.S. Congress. Congressman Dan Crenshaw of Texas and Mike Waltz of Florida introduced legislation earlier this year for the authorization uh, for the use of military force in Mexico. And in a video message uh, to the Mexican president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, sometimes called AMLO, Crenshaw basically threatened to invade Mexico and not so subtly suggested that AMLO is on the side of the cartels. Señor Presidente, usted recientemente criticó mi plan para autorizar la fuerza militar contra los carteles. Mi pregunta es para usted son las siguientes. ¿Por qué rechaza la ayuda de los Estados Unidos? ¿Por qué protege a los carteles? But before we talk about Representative Crenshaw and what's going on today, I'm wondering if you can transport us back to 2006 when uh, then Mexican President Felipe Calderón launched Operation Michoacán, which sent over 6,000 Mexican soldiers into the Mexican state of Michoacán to take on the cartels. Yeah, so uh, Felipe Calderón won the closest election in Mexican history against AMLO back then. Uh, and it was contested. AMLO claimed there was fraud. Um, there was fighting, physical fighting in Congress when Felipe Calderon went to, to take power in December 2006. So coming in, he, he kind of uh, wanted to show himself, I'm, I'm, I'm here now, you know, new sheriff in town. And was it hadn't been really discussed in, much in the campaigns, he launched this uh, military crackdown on cartels. Um, in, you know, 10 days later, uh, after the inauguration in the state of Michoacán, the military went in there. Uh, I ran over there at the time working for the Associated Press. And we went up to the town of Aguililla um, and, and saw like, you know, two helicopters above the town, a bunch of troops, the people from the town lined up uh, on their knees, you know, T-shirts over the head with soldiers there, very, very hyped up soldiers. And this was kind of the beginning of this very aggressive action uh, against the the cartels um it seemed to go well for the first year or so record uh breaking busts of drugs um actually a reduction in violence in the first year uh, and then it really exploded in Felipe, Cal Felipe Calderon's face um you know the the cartels started hitting back against the military the military carried out massacres of civilians um, and then this kind of explosion of violence really went up. You saw this huge escalation in numbers in 2008. Uh, and there's very high levels of violence which have been in Mexico since. 
I've driven across Michoacan. It has uh, lakes. It has pueblos mágicos. Uh, these very uh, uh, beautiful towns. It, it's a it's a nice place, but it did become synonymous with violence. And I think uh, in the image of uh, North Americans in, in the United States, uh, it it it, um, it it became the image of Mexico as this this country that was really at war with itself. But of course, it was intimately connected to U.S. policy. And how influential was the Bush administration uh, in Operation Michoacan? Well, following Operation Michoacan, following the first uh, you know operation in, the, in which became a national crackdown on cartels, uh, Felipe Calderon went to meet George W. Bush in Merida. And they agreed on a Merida initiative that the U.S. would support this military crackdown with uh, money and training and resources. Now, I talked to Felipe Calderon about that meeting and a couple of things. One, he said this was not an American imposition. It was actually Mexico. They went to the United States and said, I know, come on, we need some uh, cash. Now, going back to the 1980s, 1970s, the United States has a history of imposing and coercing governments to carry out anti-drug operations. So people can mix that, but actually, Felipe Calderon said in that case, it was Mexico bringing this to the table. Now, he said to me, he described the meeting, Felipe Calderon, he said he sat down with George W. Bush and he said, look, you know, I think America needs to uh, support Mexico because Americans take all these drugs and look at the damage it's doing in Mexico. And Bush said, OK, yeah, what do you need? And Calderon said, have you seen the show 24? And Bush said, yeah. I want all the gadgets in that show. <laughs> no, no, seriously, his description of the, the conversation. And this is a lot what Mexico got, because really the money, and another slightly kind of um, confusing thing about this, you look at uh, Plan Colombia, and in Plan Colombia, Colombia is a relatively smaller country with a lot less economy, and the American money really made a big difference in turning the Colombian security forces around, for good or bad. I mean, they had a lot of human rights abuses by them. Mexico is a much bigger country, it has a you know, trillion dollar economy, and it has a lot of money. The Mexican, the American money didn't really, wasn't really a game changer, but it was, the, they said, the responsibility, but also some of the technology. So you saw Black Hawk helicopters, you saw high tech wire gear coming in. Now, as we saw later, some of the Mexican security forces receiving this money were also working with cartels and carrying out abuses. So it became a bit of a. Uh, a shit show, if I can use that word. And of course, an example of that is in, I think it was 2009, the uh, Zetas broke from the Gulf cartel. And of course, the Zetas had been the, the uh, security for the Gulf cartel who had been drawn by some of Mexico's special forces um, with bigger, they had been lured away with bigger salaries. And there became a war in and of itself. And, uh, you know, between 2010 to 2012, I think even Monterrey, which is a commercial, a huge commercial city that's known for business in Mexico became an epicenter of violence. So uh, you do see this uh, this relationship or uh, symbiotic relationship in some ways between the cartels and the Mexican security forces. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so the, the setas um, were a real game changer and are very key to understand the violence in Mexico over the last two decades. They changed the game. So the, the setas, you had a, a drug lord called Ocel Cardenas, from the Gulf Cartel, uh, in, based in Matamoros, and he recruited uh, a group of elite Mexican military people from, from air forces and various divisions. Um, and he recruited them, and then they really were started their violence, particularly in the city of Nuevo Laredo, in the 2003 to six period, you saw this big escalation of violence. Now, they changed the game because pre-Setas, some of the violence was carried out by, like, gangbangers, some imported from the United States, you know, shaved heads, tattoos, people in street gangs in the U.S., in San Diego, the Logan Heights street gang, imported and carrying out violence. These were considered the tough guys because they'd grown up in these uh, uh, tough neighbors in the U.S. Sometimes you have these old school uh, kind of trigger men um, who kind of, you know, there's you know, one description of one with kind of university degrees and killing in the dark of the night, the kind of old school kind of gentleman trigger men. And the setters like changed the game. They're like military guys, bulletproof jackets, metal helmets, AK-47s, radios, let's go to work here. And they just started taking out 
you know, the the the, 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 the gang the gang members. So you can see gang members sent against them. They like part them up in bodies. Uh, and so what they changed the nature of, of the of the cartels, the drug traffickers in Mexico to paramilitary organized crime. And they bought these some of the times techniques, anti insurgency techniques, you know, taught uh, and used uh, by US backed forces in countries like Guatemala, um, El Salvador, um, you know, the idea of spreading terror into a population. They use these techniques, they unleash these techniques. Uh, but you know, with no you know, kind of military command or real renegade military guys, so you saw beheading, mass beheading, videos, and all of these things. Um, and once they did it, all of the rest of the cartels copied them. Well, they've got it. We've got to have these guys. Well, we can't have any you know, regular gangbangers anymore. We need some serious paramilitary organizations. We need to train guys, give them serious weaponry, and all this thing. So you got this. Um, what, what you see in Mexico, a very weird kind of hybrid form. Of armed conflict, uh, which becomes very confusing to people to, to try and understand it and make sense of it. You mentioned Michoacan. <clears throat> in Michoacan, now you see some of the more overt paramilitary style conflict there, where you'll see landmines, makeshift landmines, armored drones, uh, bombs, um, uh, RPG 7 grenade launchers, and these kind of more overt form of fighting. Um, but it's existing around the same time as, as places like Mexico City, where I am, which is. This, uh, you know, great 21st century city, massively popular with, you know, Americans coming here. People come in and go, wow, this is amazing. Uh, what's all the fuss about? I can sit in a, in a, having a cappuccino with my iPad and, you know, I can't see any, any violence here. Um, and, and more security here in the capital. And then you, you know, travel a couple of hours into the countryside and then you see these, you know, guys in camo and AK-47s riding around. So this kind of really weird hybrid uh, conflict you have uh, going through Mexico in the 21st century. When I listen to folks here in Washington, some of them at least seem to think that there's a simplistic military answer. Much like the war on terror, they want to have this conceptual war on drugs. And if we could just invade Mexico or <laughs> bomb the cartels or what have you, or, or perhaps give, give the Mexican military more arms, uh, we could solve this thing. Is that, is that the case? So when you, you hear the kind of discourse of the Republicans like Crenshaw and others, I think, I think they're right about two things and very wrong about one thing. They're right when they say the fentanyl problem in the United States is a really serious, severe problem that should be on the top of the political agenda. Uh, I think there was a certain... I think for, for some people you know, and, and, and people who follow drug policy, we saw in the past the war on drugs... Um, you know, exaggerations, sometimes, you know, deceptive stuff when it wasn't killing, you know, it wasn't the same level uh, of death. And now when you have more than 100,000 deaths of overdoses for two years running, that is crazy. When you have, um, according to, to, the, to these, these figures, uh, according to what people are saying about these figures, the leading cause of death for 18 to 45 year old males in America of overdoses, that's very, very serious. So we should take it very, very seriously. Second thing they're right about is there is really serious uh, organized crime in Mexico. Uh, again, I mean, there's no, I think there's no getting around this. I mean, you know, the level of, of uh, the fact, you know, they are, and they are working with corrupt government officials, you know, that, that, that's true. Where they're wrong and very seriously wrong is that you can't simply send in a couple of drones and send in a couple of mil American military and solve this. Um, it just doesn't work strategically. Um, it's not like there's like a thousand guys, you can just bomb them away and they go away. We're talking about organized crime networks that have grown up over a century, entwined with government, built into communities. Um, you know, if you go over and you bomb a, a narco camp, there's just loads more people. And you create then, you know, rather than saying Mexico's your partner to try and, you know, whatever you want to do, you're then saying, well, Mexico's an enemy and Mexico's got a very um, a history of, of defending its sovereignty and the idea of Americans coming over and, and bombing is, is crazy. Yeah, I do think you're right that saber rattling and having or, or, is something more hawks will do for domestic reasons, domestic political reasons. It does rile up the base. It is it's easy to blame the monsters abroad, so to speak, uh, than the monsters at home for a addiction crisis. Uh, that has a lot of domestic causes, frankly. 
Um, but at the same time, th- that kind of rhetoric does have its way of slowly trickling into actual serious policy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if you can give us a more nuanced uh, perspective about how these supply demand issues, because we have a demand for drugs in the U.S. and a supply coming out of Mexico. We have a demand for guns in Mexico and a supply coming out of the U.S. Um, and you just wrote a book about that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so uh, let me talk about the guns thing quickly very first. So the, the gun issue, which I had a, a four-year investigation looking at this, everyone for a long time has known that the guns handled by the cartels come from the United States. Uh, and in the United States, you have the Second Amendment and you have you know liberal laws on guns. Um, when I got into this, I realized it was more complicated um, it, it, exactly you know, how they're getting the guns. It's not only about the fact that the Second Amendment, there's like kind of a failure of basic law enforcement on this issue. And the fact that, you know, cartels, you can have single straw buyers who are people with clean records buying guns for the cartels or buying guns for gangsters. You have single straw buyers more, buying more than 700 weapons. You know, how's that happening? The same guys going shop, 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 buying, 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 AK-47s, AR-15s, um, 50 caliber rifles. You know, how come that is happening? Um, you have single sales of more than 500 firearms being bought. Or other cases where a guy walks into a shop and buys 10 identical AK-47s for the setas, the same, you know, very violent cartel we talked about. Um, and, you know, and then they go down, they used to kill an American agent in Mexico and the guy gets probation. So like, what's happening with the basic law enforcement with this? And it's something which I think can be a bipartisan, and there can be certain bipartisan agreement on this. You can kind of set the ground and say, well, look, um, you can be into having guns. That's fine. You know, we're not really getting into a deep discussion of the Second Amendment. We're not getting into even a, a deep discussion over um, assault rifles or, or, or AR-15s, you know, the, the discussion of the name. We're simply saying we don't want enormous amounts of American guns being sold to some of the most violent paramilitary organized crime in the world. It's a historic case of arms trafficking into a hybrid conflict and we're talking about total numbers estimated at more than 200,000 firearms a year going from the United States to Mexico more than 2 million guns over the last decade um really behind these hundreds of thousands of murders in Mexico I forget the name of the town in Guerrero I drove from Mexico City once where the school children were massacred and uh, it, Iguala yeah Iguala I drove to Iguala once and it's just such a bizarre place because The town has that central square, like all Mexican towns with ice cream and fruit being sold and people are happy, but there's just these murals that surround it. And there's this, this darkness that's over it. Uh, I mean, like, again, the crazy contrast uh, around this violence is there's many stories, but you know, one is the town of San Fernando in Tamaulipas. It was the scene of the biggest um, massacre where they they massacred 72 migrants um, in the countryside near the town there. There was also, a mass grave with, with almost 200 bodies there as well. Um, so you kind of this town, San Fernando, you kind of has a kind of creepy thing. You're going to go to that town. It's a kind of, you know, what is this kind of horrible, violent town you go to? And then, you know, I arrived there. It's kind of like a provincial town. And I went to the mayor's office. And the first thing they did was play me a video of they'd won the Guinness Book of Records for having the biggest ceviche. It's like a ton of ceviche. And they did that with this kind of idea of, oh, we, we, we're so known now for being the town of these massacres that, you know, we've got to try and get that so we can have, like, we're going to go to the Guinness Book of Records and have a, a, a ton of ceviche. And you've got to talk to these kind of people with the kind of like, idea of the kind of local town, oh, the violence has nothing to do with us. Another example of the contrasts in uh, the city of Veracruz, uh, now in a great port city, they have a, they have a carnival there in a, every uh, February. And this area, they have this neighbourhood there kind of middle-class neighborhood. The idea of kind of middle-class dream, building a house, look at these gardens with, you know, kiddies' bicycles and basketball hoops. And in the fields on the back there, they discovered the biggest mass grave in Mexico with almost 300 uh, bodies there. Uh, And when they started unearthing it, it was actually found by mothers who were searching for their sons. You know, it was somebody gave them a tip. They went there, started digging up the stuff. Eventually, the police, you know, realized there's massive amounts of bodies there and had to take over the excavation. When they were digging up the stuff, the smell of the death and the bodies was was, was then eeping out to these these family homes. They wrote a complaint saying, you know, we're you know, we're trying to live here with our families and we're getting this this, this smell, this stench. 
So again, it's got kind of a weird contrast of this, uh, but this kind of real tragedy that's, that's under the surface in Mexico. And you can find uh, people who have lived it and it's just like uh, sometimes horrific stories. You know, you, you really want no one to suffer. The United States is often looking abroad to protect its security at home. Uh, it, I think we have a habit, uh, you know, you could see that from the war in Afghanistan to the invasion of Iraq and including how we talk about Mexico. Uh, Mexico is sometimes described as a failed state. Mexico is perceived uh, as being in a state of chaos um, that could somehow bleed over into the United States. Uh, and, and so that's why I think we have these sort of uh, statements coming out of Congress that are militarized and interventionist in their tone. Uh, how does uh, Mexico affect the security of the United States in your view? And uh, is it right that the United States looks at these things sometimes through the lens of a military solution? So, uh, you know, you pointed out um, that you know, these cartels uh, are even much bigger than drugs. Uh, they're, they're crime cartels, these paramilitary organized crime organizations involved in the human smuggling, involved in stealing crude oil, involved in wildcat mining, involved in extortion, kidnapping, piracy, prostitution, all these different crimes. So you actually get this kind of real question of governance in Mexico with this, with these uh, groups involved in so many things. And then we look for this vocabulary to describe this and you say, you know, should we use the word narco state? Um, when, when you say actually that there's, you know, high ranking officials corrupt and working with cartels or use the word failed state. If you, know, you, you, you can have these battles happening, these mass graves and they can't enforce it. I would shy away from both those words. Um, Narco state, I think, is a bit more justifiable. Um, you know, you can justify it uh, intellectually in terms of like, well, if you have uh, high levels of the state working with, with, with narco cartels, you know, is it a narco state? The problem is then if you start to use that narco state, it kind of starts to really place it as a kind of a renegade bad thing that can't be dealt with. So if it's a narco state, is it like, you know, is it like North Korea? You know, should, you know, should it can be, you know, cut off? Can you have relations with them? I think that's not the case because one of the things is that with, within the Mexican state, you have you know, many different aspects happening. You have some aspects of the state which actually function quite well. I mean, kids are going to school here. A big school system is you know, educating a lot of kids pretty decently. You've got a health system in some aspects of it better than the United States in some aspects of public health here. Um, you have uh, you know a lot you know people coming and collecting you know garbage and a lot of you know uh, works and you have you know other elements of Mexican society which are functioning. So again, the idea of a failed state I think is not the best way to describe it either. A failed state makes you think of somewhere like Somalia, where when it really is there is no kind of central state government apparatus working. In Mexico, you have a kind of big state apparatus working, and again, you have a lot of things and, and a kind of normality functioning around this. So I think. Uh, you know, we have, we need to look at it as being well. You know, Mexico is this developed society with many uh, actually functioning uh, parts of, of of a state of society, of cultural institutions, and so forth, but with this really big problem, and there is a failure in public security and security dealing with these things. Um, and so that's I think that's the way to kind of start off. I think, I think you, you do need to look at Mexico as being partners. You know, both and even despite the corruption, the Mexican government still look at the Mexican, you know, Mexican government and society as being partners in this to try and work with this and try and I think it's got to try and find a way out of this stage by stage. I think it's one escalating a confrontation between uh, between governments, between societies is not the way to go.